Well, hello, GCS students. Coming to you from my classroom on Monday, May 11th, this is our chapel for today. As uh, we've, as teachers, we've talked about wanting to have a chapel service or something for you for a couple of more times until the end of the year, just so that you can have some semblance of being in the Word with us here at, at the school. Uh, I was privileged with the chance to do this first time as we are looking at the closing of the school year. Uh, to do a chapel online like this. So it is a privilege once again to be able to be in God's Word with you. And uh, it's from my classroom. Nothing much has changed. All of the coffee cups are still on the, on the windowsill waiting. There's still policemen driving by with their sirens on. Nothing much has changed, uh, except you're not here, which makes it really lousy. So uh, needless to say, I miss you guys. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Today, though, I do want to open with a quick word of prayer. Uh, talking to God briefly, inviting His presence as you're listening and watching, and hopefully you're going to get into the Word for it. one verse. Is all we're talking about. Philippians 1.6. So if you have a Bible, or you're on your phone, or you have a Bible near your phone, or whatever, Philippians 1.6 is where we're going. It's just going to take a minute and consider a couple of things from that verse. So I'll just ask God's uh, blessing as we're in His Word, and then we'll get into the chapel. God, thank you for the students who are willing to spend a few minutes to watch this and to listen to this and to engage the Word as you have given it to us to reveal yourself. Thank you that your Word never returns worthless or wasted. Thank you, God, that in your Word you uh, lavish on us truths of your wonderful character. Thank you that your Word is perfect and right all the time and that by it you've never failed. Thank you that you can that we can be in your word and that you will teach us from it. Lord, I ask that you draw close to those who are uh, pausing for just a minute to be in it with me right now. Bless them as they're in your word. Help them see you during this time that they're in, good, bad, or indifferent. Help them to see you and know your presence and trust you more because they've been in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Philippians 1.6 is where we're going. But as I begin, I have a question for you. Have you guys ever seen a building that's not been finished yet. Uh, something that's been started but never finished. Uh, one time I saw a house being built near the Red Hill section of Altoona, uh, sort of going up uh, Route 36, 18th Street, like you're going up into the mountains. Um, it, I was probably six years old or so, and what looked to be like a really nice brick split level house being built uh, was beginning to be under construction. Uh, I saw it every day on my way to school. But one day I noticed that it didn't look different. Uh, it didn't have anything new about it. It looked like everything just stopped on the construction site. It just ended. And it continued to look that day, each day that I passed by for the remainder of that school year. About five years ago, I passed that house. It still was not finished. First time I had seen it under construction, I was roughly six years old. About five years ago, decades later, it still sat unfinished and it looked sad. When something that is begun uh, to, and it looks to have so much promise is just stopped mid-construction, it's a sad picture. Uh, it almost looked pathetic as it sat there. Still have, it still had bricks in a pile from almost 30 years earlier waiting to be used and applied to the house. This was about five years ago. Last year I passed by that house and lo and behold, someone bought it and completed the house. Uh, I was so happy to see this house that sat for about 30 years unfinished, finally come finished, had a yard installed and grass had been grown and flowers were growing and a swing set was put in and someone was living there making that structure finally uh, come to fruition. It, it finally was doing what it was meant to do, be a house. And it was really neat as I passed by and saw that house thinking the very first time I saw it on a wintry day in my first grade year of school, finally, uh, almost, it was over 30 years later, come to be finished. God has something to say about business and finishing business in His Word. Something to say about finishing business in your life and mine. Our passage for this month at the school would have been, if we were together, in our under construction theme, our passage this month, month would have been Philippians 1.6. This is what it reads like. By the way, Paul's the author of this letter to the Philippian church. This is what he said. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love this verse. 
I have a poster of this verse on my wall here in this classroom. I sign my name to letters referencing Philippians 1.6. Most of my times I sign my name. I love this verse. There's such great promise in it and such great hope in it. Uh, I do this because I'm an example of, a living example of God starting something that he continues to work on. He's continuing to work on me, and someday he'll complete what he began at this point over four decades ago. Uh, there's three things I want to consider in this verse. Um, the three things that he mentions to the church at Philippi through this verse are three things that we can walk away with and consider for our lives. Number one, God begins things in us on purpose and with purpose. God does begin things in your life. Using circumstances and events and environments and people and likes and dislikes, he uses things and he begins things in our lives and he does so with a purpose. The second thing that we see from this verse is this. God completes what he begins. He completes his work and he always completes his work. Even if we don't quite see it, he does. He's been known to be the great finisher of all work he's ever started. And he's actively working right now in you. The fact that you're watching this and engaging the Bible, he's working and he won't quit until he's done. That's a promise. And the third thing I want to consider is this. God's work in you has eternal purposes. Not just purposes for this life here and now and the remainder of your days on earth. God's work in you has eternity in his mind, past this life, on out into forever. There's bigger things going on as God's working in you and in your life now. There, there's bigger things going on than merely the coronavirus or the school you're not ending or the fizzling out of all that we had hoped and looked forward to at the end of our school year, which is sad and very disheartening and very disappointing. But there's more going on here than merely uh, the next few months of our lives and what it will look like. There's much more happening because the perspective that Paul gives us in this verse, which applies to us now, has an eternal perspective. And I think Paul and God would desire that we see things with lens, lenses that are eternal. So let's look at that first thing. God begins things in us with a purpose. Um, the first thing in this verse I want to see, go back to this verse. Being confident of this very thing. The first thing I want you to see is the word confident. Paul said that. He has no doubt, and he has no doubt, because if there was ever a person that God would have quit on, and that Paul would think he would not be confident God working in and completing a job in, if Paul would ever think of a person that God would quit on, it would be Paul. Um, he's confident because God works God's glory out as God worked God's purpose is out in Paul. God's work, God worked out God's own glory as God worked out his own purposes in the life of Paul. And Paul realized that. He was confident in that. God transformed Paul into who he desired Paul would be turning out to be. And the purpose was to show God's power. Consider Paul's storyline. Paul was a persecutor of Christians, rising in the ranks of the Pharisaic leadership of his day, and he was converted into the most powerful missionary of all time. Do you think this was for Paul's sake? No, it wasn't for Paul's sake. It was for God's sake, in the name of God's sake, and God's renown, and glory, and majesty, and magnificence to be seen in a person who was so wretched, being totally turned around because of God's purposes and beginning a work in him. God purposed for Paul to be who he had been to show the glory of God's power in his change. Paul mentions to the Galatian church something. It's very interesting that Paul says this. Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, He's speaking in Galatians 1 about how wretched he had been as a killer of Christians and a persecutor of Christians. And he gets to this point in verse 15 of chapter 1 of Galatians that said, But when it pleased God, when God was ready to begin this work in me, God did. Because I know now, Paul says in Galatians, that from way back when I was in my mom's womb, God had planned and purposed to begin a work in me. Paul it makes no... Uh, he, he, he does not mince words here 
And he does not mince words in his meaning in Philippians 1 either. God had separated Paul for a work that God would begin in Paul when God was ready, using circumstances that Paul had been engaged in, which God had planned before time, circumstances and events that weren't great, circumstances that made Paul look bad and it was hurtful to people. But God had purposed that all these things would be working out in Paul because God begins a work, even in ways we don't fully understand. And sometimes it might feel like it hurts, but when God's ready, he will reveal how he's going to show you his turning you into what he's created you to be using the work that you've done and that he's going to continue to do in you here's what paul realized a condoned murder of christians by god's grace and through god's power and for god's glory would be turned into the greatest missionary who ever lived paul is confident in verse 6 of philippians 1 being confident of this very thing he's confident that god works out things in life because Paul experienced God working out the impossible in Paul's life and Paul realized that from before he was ever born God had purposed all that was happening in Paul's life to go down just as it did so God would get glory at God's change in Paul where are you right now as you're waiting for all this to end where is your attitude where's my attitude how are we looking at God desiring that we develop and be stronger and reflecting him a clearer reflection of a God follower, a truster in Jesus Christ through these circumstances that we can't put any trust in, politicians or otherwise. Where are you at in this as God's working on you? God is using your circumstances to purpose, purposefully shape you who, to who he created you to be. God is using your circumstances to purposefully shape you into who he created you to be. Just like he did with Paul, so he's doing with you. The second thing I want to look at this verse is this. God completes his work always. There's no doubt that God had completed in Paul the purposes for which he created Paul. And we see that God kept working out his plan in Paul's life. Paul's joy increased. Philippians is actually a happy letter. If you were to read Philippians, which would take you about eight minutes to read, you'll see that it's a very happy letter. It's crazy happy in its writing. Paul is a happy guy uh, revealing God and his greatness throughout the book of Philippians. Uh, Paul knew that God completed his work on Paul and that God was not done in his intentions with Paul and it made Paul happy. And he wrote this letter to the Philippians to tell them that. <clears throat> Paul would believe in God and trust him more by God working in Paul's life. The very things that God brought into Paul's life and governed and allowed in, both governing and allowing. Paul realized that God's governance and allowance of the circumstances and things which weren't always favorable to a human, these are things that Paul realized God was working in. He always completed his work, which made Paul very happy. God never left Paul alone. When things really got ugly, he was never alone. While Paul was in prison, he was never alone. He wasn't by himself ever. Uh, while we're isolated as we have been so much here, God intends for us to see we're actually not alone. If anything, he's calling out saying, hey, get a load of me. Check this out. I got a whole lot more amazing things to realize than anything in the world could make you amazed by. While traveling and doing the mundane work of his normal days, Paul was not alone. While on trial, he was not alone. While in prison, he was not alone. God always completes his work because he never leaves you alone. You're never by yourself. You're never lonely. Truly, if you're a believer or a follower in Jesus Christ, Paul had such a settledness about him because he was never alone. He knew God was with him all the time. This is exactly what we need right now. The remembering and the recognition and the realizing that we're not alone. God's still very present, actively working out things in your life for your good and for his glory. God continually worked in Paul's life and God never left Paul alone. The same goes for you. God is continually working in your life, even in these circumstances you're in and I'm in. And he will never leave us alone. The third thing and last thing I want to talk to you about quickly from Philippians 1.6 is this. God works in you his eternal purposes. Again, looking at Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, he who had, had begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul mentions the day of Jesus Christ in this verse in his note. This is not by accident. Paul wants the readers of his letter to recognize the 
eternality of their lives. Paul wants us to realize we are eternal beings. We aren't born here. We don't just end here. We're born here and we live on forever. Paul wants us to see that in this little note until the day of Jesus Christ. The greatest portion of your existence begins at the end of this life. Let me say that again. The greatest, longest, biggest, most full, most real portion of your existence ends, excuse me, begins at the end of this life. You really begin to live fully and realize the greatest reality when this life ends. As we get through this life, I hope and I trust that you get to know God more, the greatest reality. As you get to know him more, you get closer to him through this life, you're getting ever so close to the one who is most real, and you'll fully realize the reality of God when this life ends. The day of Jesus Christ is a note for thinking in terms of an eternal mindset, having a lens that sees eternity over and past things in this short life here. The greatest portion of your existence begins at the end of this life. So my question is, what are you working toward? Well, what do you think God is working toward? For those of you who remember the 10 truths in my classes, do you remember truth number 10? Most of you didn't like it because it was the longest truth, but truth number 10, uh, those who trust in Jesus will receive the promise of eternal life and join God forever in heaven. Uh, those who trust in Jesus will receive the promise of eternal life and join God forever in heaven. God had eternal purposes for Paul, which Paul would ultimately experience when his days on earth ended. Paul's experience as he passed through death's door was the beginning of never-ending bliss and enjoyment of God forever. The most important and most exciting and most interesting person in the universe is God. And Paul realized that as God was finishing his work in him, always willing to complete his work in him, his work would be done, God's work would be done, when Paul met him face to face. And all of the work God had done in the life behind Paul would have been worth it. Eternity would show that. So it will be with you. You who God has begun a work in. Be thinking bigger than the events of here and now. Be thinking bigger and broader than merely what's going on this year, this month, this week, this day. The remainder of your earthly days will be short. The greatest portion of your existence begins at the end of this. Realize that God has something much bigger. He has purpose to shape you and ready you for. God has something way bigger and greater that he's shaping you for than what your mind can wrap its greatest imagination around. And he's using this life to work on you, to prepare you for it. Something greater and more exciting and more enjoyable and more fun and more satisfying than anything you could ever have planned or scripted on your own. This is what Philippians 1, 6 is about. And this is what our being under construction really is for. And it's a good thing, even at times when it doesn't seem that great. So let God turn and shift your mind. Let God shift your attitude and shift your perspective on what you see and how things are going down and how they have not been going the way we would have wanted, especially for you seniors. And we're all very aware of that. Don't let this Curb your enthusiasm and awareness and understanding and enjoyment of what God is readying you for through this difficulty. There's three implications of this verse today. Three implications. Number one, God is using your circumstances to purposefully shape you to be who he created you to be. They're not by accident. God's not taken off guard by what's happening. He's not pulling his hair out thinking, what am I going to do the coronavirus? He's not taken by surprise by anything. He's God. He's using your circumstances in your life to purposefully shape you to be who he's created you to be. And that is a person who is the happiest person that you could possibly imagine yourself to be. That's who God made you to be in spite of difficulty. He's using your circumstances to make you into that person. Second implication is this. God is continually working in your life. He's constantly working on you. It's a great thing to know the God of all creation who has the power over everything and everyone. He's not left you alone. He's working on you today while you're watching this. He's not done with you. The third thing is this. And the last thing. God has a design for the remaining days in your life, which he intends to effect 
excuse me, which he intends to affect your eternity with him in wonderful and amazing ways. The, des the design that God has for the remaining days in your life is to help you see now a glimpse of how great he is, how powerful he is, how much bigger and stronger he is than all the things that are preventing you from what you think is enjoyment now. He's bigger and stronger, and at will, just like that, he can make a change because he wants to. Today's Monday, the 11th of May. Saturday, the 9th of May, if you live in Altoona or anywhere nearby, it was snowing. There were snow squalls. I was in a grocery store parking lot. A snow squall began. People started driving like crazy. I almost crashed in a snow squall in the middle of May. I think God's just showing off. He's powerful. He's stronger. He can do what he wants. And he will accomplish his purposes in you because he'll never quit and never leave you alone. And what he's doing in you, you can trust, is only going to, if you trust him, what he's doing in you, you can trust, is only going to help you enjoy him even more for all eternity. So have that way of thinking as you conclude your weeks of school this year and look forward to what he has in store for you to show you more of himself even in difficult times. God, thank you for those who've listened. I trust that you will take what you've laid out in your word, allow the students and whoever's watching to hear. Help us trust you more. We love you, God. Help us love you more. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So guys, I miss you. look forward to seeing you in person. If any of you want to talk, you can call me anytime. 932-1626. Those of you who are my students know that. But uh, you're welcome to call anytime. Email me anytime. Uh, I hope you're doing well, and I'll keep praying for you every day. God bless.